I thought you said nine minutes. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I hope everyone's going to settle into their seats and grab a snack and something to drink. Um, so we're really excited to the Race and Ethnicity Working Group and the Department of Sociology and the Bunch Center are really pleased and excited to have Mary Barr here to share with us um, her recent publication. So after graduating summa cum laude with a bachelor's in sociology from UCLA, Mary, Dr. Mary Barr received her doctorate in sociology with distinction and African American studies from Yale. She's wow. received fellowships from prestigious institutions, including the American Council of Learned Societies New Faculty <coughs> Fellowship at Yale, the Black Metropolis Research Consortium <coughs> Summer Fellowship at the University of Chicago, and the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Fellowship at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard. So she's previously held teaching positions at Pomona College, Armstrong Atlantic State University, and Yale, and she currently holds a lecturer position in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Clemson University in South Carolina. So for her most recent publication, Dr. Barr used historical and ethnographic qualitative methods to explore the implications of segregation and desegregation practices for intergroup relations and educational inequalities mm -hmm. between white and black residents in her childhood neighborhood outside of Chicago, Illinois. So again, as I was saying before, we are honored to welcome her back to the West Coast and excited to hear the many insights from her book, Friends Disappear, The Battle for Racial Equality in Evanston. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Mary Beth. So I'm, I'm over here because I need to be with, with them. I'm trying out a new presentation format, Slate Adobe, and so we'll, we'll just cross our fingers that it works. Um, all right, so as many of you know, I, um, I am a UCLA graduate. I'm so excited to be back on campus. Um, and I want to start by actually dedicating this talk to some of my former professors, um, one of whom is here, Professor Robert Emerson. Um, he's a professor emeritus in the sociology department. The classes that I took with these folks were amazing. They changed my life. Um, I just can't say enough about it without like just, you know, bursting into tears. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, of course, I also want to thank Mary Jo Johnson, who was here when I was an undergrad and who was so supportive and continues to be supportive, um, and, and Don Jefferson, who both of whom helped organize this talk. And there are probably other people behind the scenes that I don't know about, so thank you to everybody for everything <laughs> um, and for, for coming to the talk today. Um, all right, so um, I, I grew up I grew up in Evanston, and I was taught my whole life that it was an ideal place. Ideal because of its schools, its beautiful homes, and its stunning lakefront. But ideal in particular because of what people imagined as perfect integration. And then I went to college and graduate school, and I began to sense the falseness in those stories. There's truth, of course. Close interracial friendships were made, but those friendships didn't last. Now, Evanston isn't unusual. Um, it is representative of many progressive cities in the North that purport to be integrated but um, simultaneously have terrible racial disparities in housing, education, and employment. These are places that have black and white people living together in the same city, but black poverty is within blocks of white <coughs> affluence. And so I wanted to start with this cartoon. It was actually published in the Washington Post in 1963, and you can see it's a um, a train depot and there are businessmen who are um, standing on the platform waiting to catch the train to go into Chicago where they presumably work 
It could be Evanston or any other number of suburbs that line Chicago's North Shore. One, um, in the image, one businessman is saying to another, those Alabama stories are sickening. Why can't they be like us and find some nice refined way to keep Negroes out? It's this subtle variant of racism that I grew up around and that I explore in my book, Friends Disappear. <coughs> This is the photo that inspired the book. It's a picture of me and my friends taken in Evanston in 1974. The book examines how public policies and social practices shaped our life experiences <coughs> and outcomes. It is based on interviews that I conducted with the people in the photo and extensive archival research. Evanston's civil rights movement provides the backdrop for our life stories. Now, it might seem strange to hear me say Evanston and civil rights movement in the same sentence, and that's because um, so much of what we know about the civil rights movement is about the Southern movement, right? So we all, you know, we all know who Rosa Parks is. We know she um, refused to give up her seat in Montgomery. Um, we know about Martin Luther King's attempt to integrate businesses in downtown Birmingham, but we know much less about what was happening in the North. The fact is that what is now called the Black Freedom, Freedom Movement was happening across the country, even in places like Evanston. So in the next photos that I show you, there'll be photos from Evanston's, um, again, civil rights movement. Evanstonians really came together to challenge the, the status quo, and I think that's important to note. They protested Southern racism. They protested segregated movie theaters and segregated housing. What year was this, Mary? These are all from the 1960s. Early 60s? Yeah, yeah. Well, not just early, the, the whole... The whole 60s. Yeah, the 60s. <laughs> <clears throat> this is a photograph of Reverend um, Jacob Blake. He led the fight for open housing. I wanted to just click through. As I said, I'm playing around with a new presentation mode I, got, I don't know what to call it so it might not be as seamless as it will once I learn how to use it better but as you can see Evanston's movement was multiracial all all residents I think really valued diversity and they joined forces in the 1960s to end racial inequality in housing, education, and employment. So I wanted to just show you some pictures of some protests and things like that so you get an overall um, picture of what was happening. Now black Evanstonians maintained a community that was independent of whites. Evanston had a sharply delineated black ghetto on the west side of the city that was separated from the white community by tracks, train tracks, and a sanitary canal. Um, so the black community really did have separate civic and social institutions, including a separate YMCA. There were two YMCAs in Evanston, one for whites and one for blacks. And this is a photograph of the, um, of the, um, the black YMCA. So there were se separate recreational facilities, there were separate churches, there were separate hospitals. This can, you know, this is surprising. Um, I mean, it was surprising when I found this out. There were two hospitals, Evanston and St. Francis, who would not admit black patients or hire black nurses or doctors. And so the black community got together and raised funds and built their own hospital, community hospital, on the west side. There were separate schools. Um, foster school was the elementary school that most black children attended, and whites um, attended um, the others. Additionally, there was a large economic divide. Looking at our group specifically, the, the group that's in the photograph, um, which I believe is representative of the city as a whole, 
White families were really among the elite, while black families were members of the working poor. All right, so probably not everybody here has been to Evanston. So let me show you a map of Evanston and try to situate it a little bit for you. Um, Evanston uh, borders Chicago to the south. It borders Lake Michigan to the east. It borders a, a predominantly Jewish suburb named Skokie to the west. And to the north are a long line of all very wealthy, affluent, all-white suburbs. Um, and as you can see from the map, this is, oh sorry, let me move this up a little bit. I don't know why that. Um, so this is a map from 1960 and it shows Evanston's African American population. Um, as you can see, most African Americans lived on the west side uh, in an area that was cordoned off by train tracks and a sanitary canal. The area is in a rough shape of a triangle and actually was has been referred to as the black or was referred to as the black um, triangle. Now this isn't because of preference and I probably don't need to tell you guys this I'm preaching to the choir here I know but it's because of social and public policies that determined where people could and could not live. An early suburb Evanston made room for servants and workers, including independent African-American households, as long as they stayed on the west side, away from the lake. And this was accomplished at first by placing racial clauses in property deeds, specifying that homes could only be sold to white Christians. But after 1948 and the Supreme Court's decision in Shelley versus Kramer, which held that courts could not enforce racial clauses, realtors became the front line of defense for the white community. They refused to show property to African Americans located in white neighborhoods. In this photo, a protester carries a sign that reads, Dogs in Birmingham, Realtors in Evanston. <laughs> when our parents moved to Evanston in the early 1960s, they were directed to different sides of the city by realtors. The girls' parents bought homes in whites-only neighborhoods near the lake, where land was valuable and home ownership was high. Our fathers were professionals who commuted to work in Chicago like the men in the cartoon that I showed you earlier, while our mothers stayed home to raise us. The boys' families were southern migrants from the Carolinas. When they arrived in Evanston, they were steered west. These families rented homes in an area near industry and, as I said before, bound between a sanitary canal and railroad tracks. The boys' mothers worked as domestics and their fathers were, were, were factory workers. So there were very clear class differences between our families in terms of wealth, education, and work. After settling, our parents enrolled us in one of 16 elementary schools shown on the next slide. Evanston's schools were evenly dispersed across the city, as you can see in the map, according to what is known as a neighborhood school model that placed schools in residential neighborhoods within walking distance of children's homes. The combination of residential segregation and a neighborhood school system meant that the schools were also segregated. So my African-American friends attended foster school on the west side, while me and my white friends went to schools in our neighborhoods. In 1966, the school board hired Dr. Gregory Coffin, a well-known educator from Derry in Connecticut, to implement the city's desegregation plan. And this is what the plan really entailed. Foster school was closed down, converted to a magnet school, and the children who attended Foster were evenly divided and dispersed to other formerly all-white schools in the city by bus, right? So it was really, it, the plan relied on a massive busing plan. Can you mention the 
I'm sorry. The year, can you mention it again? Oh, um, this was, um, the, the plan was um, implemented in the fall of 1967. Thank you. Sorry, I don't think I did mention it. Um, oh, because Dr. Coffin was hired the year before in 66. Yeah. <laughs> Convinced that technology could heal the city's social wounds, the school board paid for computer-generated um, redistricting. So the school board hired um, technicians at the Illinois Institute of Technology to really come up with the new boundaries. Um, and they did. They, they, drew new bond, they drew new boundaries, and students were reassigned so that each school had a quote-unquote Negro to white ratio similar to the city at large. The black and white friends in the photograph that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation were among the first generation to attend the newly integrated schools. And so, as you can imagine, during my interviews with those folks, um, I asked them what they remembered about, the, about school desegregation, and I got a variety um, of, of responses. And so here, these are two quotes from, um, from my interviews, and also I think these are in the book as well. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about each one. So Jesse uh, had been a, uh, he was an African-American student, um, and he had gone to Foster. Um, and he was transferred to Orrington School. And he had really positive memories. You know, he told me, it, he, he loved that he got to get on the bus and go to a new part of Evanston that he had never seen before. You know, he really remembered it as being quite an adventure, right? And so um, he, as I said, his memories of the whole experience were really positive, and he felt like he had been singled out, like he'd been chosen. You know, he didn't understand that all of the kids in Foster got bust out, right? And so he said, in part, they thought I was one of the gooder kids, so they wanted me to have a better chance, so they bust me out over to Orrington School. Now Chip, on the other hand, he didn't have great memories. Um, he remembered very clearly, very vividly, the very first day that he arrived at his new school, Willard, and he said, you know, I kind of felt like we were, I wouldn't say caged animals, but the white kids and their parents were out there and the buses pulled up and everybody's mouths are open, but their eyes are wide open and they're looking. Now, Chip had been at Foster for kindergarten, first, second, third, and fourth, and, the, and, and, and was shipped, uh, it's not shipped up, bust out um, for his fifth grade, you know, for, for his fifth grade year. So you can imagine how disconcerting that would be for a young child. You know, he was taken out of his neighborhood, away from his friends, away from the teachers and staff and principal that he knew so well for one final year into a completely, like, different part of the city with all new people. So I don't think it's a surprise that his, you know, his memories were more, more negative. I, it's very interesting to me that when I asked the same question to the white kids in the photo, they had no idea that the schools had even desegregated. Um, and I think that's because our lives didn't change as a result. The burden of desegregation was firmly placed on the you know backs of black children right um, we we didn't notice a difference because nothing really uh, excuse me nothing really changed um, so like I said black children really bore the brunt of the plan first they lost their neighborhood school right second um, they had to get on buses now to go um, away to school and what that meant is that they had to wake up earlier they got home later at the end of the day. When school was over, they had to leave immediately. They had to jump on the bus right away. And that meant that they couldn't participate in co-curricular or extracurricular activities. They couldn't take part in tutoring or study hall or any kind of intramural sports. They couldn't hang around after school on the playground, right? Um, also, this really, I think, prevented interracial friendships from developing. The biggest problem of all, however, um, was that the elementary schools did not have cafeterias. Because of the neighborhood school model, 
right, where um, schools were located in neighborhoods so that small children could walk back and forth. Um, the schools had been built without cafeterias. And so children walked home for lunch and then walked back for their afternoon classes. But bused black children no longer had that option. They had to bring their lunches with them, and while their white classmates walked home for hot